Well, hello once again, everybody, uh, and welcome to part four of Love at First Like. Our topic today is going to be relationships, and specifically, we're really going to talk about uh, how relationships develop online. Um, so sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy. Now, uh, before we get started, I want you to think about a couple of questions, as we've done in previous parts. The first is, how do you think relationships develop online? Um, and after that, I want you to think about whether or not you think they can go beyond relationships that happen only face-to-face. -face. Uh, and what I mean by beyond is can they be more intense, can they move faster, um, can they be considered better, and I, I use better very uh, very reluctantly because better is a pretty loaded term. Um, we might almost suggest, you know, the first question deals with quote-unquote normal relationships, and the second question deals with hypernormal relationships. And just like the previous part, I want you to uh, think back to these questions after this part is over and see if your answers are still the same as they are right now. First though, I'd like to ask you a couple more questions. Um, and if you haven't figured this out by now, I, I like to ask questions. Um, I like to have people think about stuff before completely telling them, you know, this is how you should think. So. I want to uh, first ask how you would describe me. You know, if you had to say, for example, choose five words that you think describe me, what would those five be? Now that you have uh, some of those words and some of those thoughts in mind about how you would describe me, my second question would be, how did you know? I mean, what, what led you to come up with those words specifically? Now the reason I ask these questions and uh, the reason I point these things out is because you were able to do these things even though you've never met me or seen me face to face. And that's going to be kind of a, a cornerstone idea behind the theories that we're going to talk about today. Now I'll ask you to first take a look at uh, one more news article about Monty Teo. Um, you can click on the link here to, to get to that article. Uh, to me, one of the more interesting parts about this article is Monty's quote that his emotions were real. Uh, this is something I really want you to keep in mind as we move throughout the rest of this part and as we come to really try to figure out and finalize our understanding, well not finalize, but at least again introduce um, our understanding of how relationships uh, progress online. So when we think about relationship development online, the first thing I want to bring your attention to is a theory known as social information processing theory. And this is a theory that was originally formulated by Joseph Walther, who, if you read one of the uh, articles in the first part um, about Monty Teo, uh, he was cited in that. He was quoted as talking about um, relationships online. Um, and this is because he's one of the uh, main people and one of the smartest people who studies this. Um, now, Walther's original theory um, was, was designed at a time when some of the prevailing thought seemed to suggest that relationships uh, couldn't really happen online. Um, and he suggested, hey, they can. Um, and here's how. Now, a couple of assumptions that his, this theory makes is first, uh, it assumes that as communicators and as people, we have the same interpersonal goals no matter what channel we use. We want to uh, affiliate with people. We want to form relationships. We want to reduce uncertainty about them. We want to form impressions about them. We want to do all of these things, no matter if we're talking to someone through face-to-face -face or through email or through Facebook or whatever channel we might be using. Now, the second part of this is he also suggests that we can accomplish these goals no matter what channel we use. So all of these things are possible, uh, whether, again, we're doing it through face-to-face -face, or through email, or through text messaging, or through Facebook, or a combination of all of them. Now with the suggestion that we can do all of these things, the question is, how do we accomplish these goals? And again, social information processing theory suggests the ways that we do this. First, we use whatever information is available uh, within the channel that we're using in order to accomplish our goals. Um, so, you know, a lot of people talk, especially in 92 and in, in, in the early 90s, talked about how CMC and other and technologically mediated communication lacked nonverbals. We still might suggest that it has reduced nonverbals. 
but it does have other pieces of information. For example, we can talk to each other. We can give information through what we type. Um, we have little, we we can take, for example, people's um, email addresses if we're talking through email, and that might give us some clues about who they are, or at least who they think they are. We might look at timestamps and see what time a message was sent. We might use that. So we use whatever information is available to us within a given channel in order to figure out about people and, and continue relationships. Um, the other thing that we do is when there's a limitation, we circumvent it. We somehow find a way to get around it. So again, we have these reduced nonverbals. Um, so we come up with a system of emoticons, for example. Um, we can't look at somebody and make judgments about them, at least, you know, especially if there, if there isn't visual information. So instead to figure out, a, you know, some uh, information about the person, we ask more questions and we disclose more about ourselves. Um, so we do all of these things. We use what's there and we overcome the limitations by being somewhat creative and somewhat, again, just using what is available to us. Now the other part of, uh, of SIP then is it suggests that forming relationships and uh, forming impressions of people online takes longer than it does face to face. We don't have, for example, visual information and other nonverbals uh, to go on to figure out about somebody. Also, it takes longer to read a message that someone sends to you, think about your answer, type it back to them, send it, have them read it, and send it back to you. So although we can accomplish all of these goals online, SIP says, social information, process, social information processing theory says that it takes longer using uh, technology, using computer-mediated communication. Now this link is to a short uh, couple minute YouTube video uh, about social information processing theory. It does a pretty good job with the highlights and the main points of the theory, um, although the audio on it is, is a little quiet. Um, so if you want to take a look at it, feel free. Now this does leave a few questions and some other interesting things to think about uh, with social information processing theory. Uh, as we said, time is, is an important factor uh, in relational development, according to, to SIP. Um, it, things just take longer. But the question, one question that we can ask is, are there some pieces of information or some things uh, that you can figure out online um, that actually speed up the process? So are there things, I don't know, maybe pictures that you can see on Facebook or other pieces of information um, that impact this development and, again, make it go faster? That's something that uh, we can still try to investigate in the future. Another interesting question I think that this theory suggests, um, and, and, and you know, might be consistent with, is if it takes longer, um, and as part of that it means that you have to kind of put more effort into developing a relationship online oftentimes, does this, can this actually make us feel closer to others? Um, if you know, for example, and you have to put the work in, and you know that somebody else is putting the work in, does that make you feel more valuable? Does that make the relationship more valuable? If you're willing to put the extra effort into keeping a relationship and creating a, a relationship um, through this restricted, quote-unquote, restricted channel, does that make you feel that the relationship is better and closer? And that's something we're going to you know, pick up a little bit uh, as we go into some of the other stuff we're going to talk about in this part. Another thing uh, is that skills matter. And we talked about this a little bit in the, the previous part. Um, but it has been shown that uh, we can kind of get to these kinds of feelings and the suggestion is that if you're more skilled with using the channel it's more likely that you're able to overcome the limitations and to use the circumventions and to use the affordances of the channel uh, to accomplish your goals so there might be some you know people who are just better at doing this than others uh, that doesn't make you bad or if you're not good at doing it. it doesn't make someone bad or good if they are good at doing it uh, it just means that there's differences, and those are important to keep in mind. Now, another uh, kind of important thing to think about um, with relational development online is the notion of channel switching. Um, most relationships probably do not stay solely online or solely offline, for that matter, uh, in today's day and age, but instead we use all channels available to us. So what happens um, when we start... A relationship or interaction with a person online, how do we decide when to move it into, for example, the channel of face-to-face? -face? Um, I think this is a kind of interesting cartoon to get us thinking about this notion. 
So for a relationship that begins online, or for a person you meet first online, when should you decide to move that relationship to face-to-face? -face? Well, the suggestion is you should either move it, you should either move it to face-to-face -to -face pretty early on in that relationship, or you should decide to never move it to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, basically, the notion here and the idea is Oftentimes, as we'll move on to talk about here is something in a second, when you interact with people online, you can the possibility exists to idealize that person. We kind of build up expectations uh, for what that person is going to be like face to face. Um, oftentimes, when we then meet face to face, those expectations are shattered. Um, and so if you meet face to face early, you don't allow those expectations to build and build and build to an unrealistic point. If you decide to never move it to face-to-face, -face, then those expectations never get shattered. So the research done by Ramirez and Zhang seems to suggest that if you're going to switch um, from online to face-to-face, -face, you should do it early or do it never. Now, kind of building off of that idea, uh, the question can be asked as to whether or not uh, online relationships can go beyond face-to-face -face relationships. Can they be faster? Can they be more intense? Um, and again, going back to Joe Walter, he suggests that yes, they can. That there are conditions and situations that exist um, under which a relationship can be what he calls a hyper-personal relationship online. So what are those conditions? Hyper-personal relationships seem to happen when a combination of sender effects, receiver effects, channel effects, and feedback effects all come together. First, hyperpersonal relationships can happen when senders selectively self-present themselves to look really good. And there is uh, some suggestions that online interaction um, allows for people to selectively self-present themselves and make themselves look really good. You know, it allows for the ability to do that, at times at least. Um, now, combine that with receivers who can idealize their partner um, because they don't have to constantly be reminded for example of the interaction partner's negative side um, like you often do face to face when you see somebody all the time so you've got senders who are making themselves look really good and receivers who are then in turn also idealizing that sender you can see how under those conditions uh, just those two people uh, you know come to see the, their partners as looking really good now on top of that the channel allows for disentrainment, as we talked about before. Uh, disentrainment allowing those that selective self-presentation and idealization to occur, but also blocking out some of the other um, things that can get in the way of processing messages and, and so on and so forth. And then finally, you have feedback effects that can occur. And those feedback effects uh, work as sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I start to see you as, for example, a fun person and think that you're a nice person to talk to, I will respond to you in a way that gives you confidence. I'll respond positively to you. That gives you confidence, and that makes you into a more confident person, a more fun person, a more extroverted person, whatever it might be. So when you have all of these things kind of coming together, the possibility exists for a very intense and a very fast relationship to develop online. Now, we come full circle back to where we started with the Monte Teo story. Think about what you've read about the Monte Teo story, what you've heard about it, and also think about what we've just talked about with social information processing theory, hyperpersonal, and even going back to last part with, uh, with uh, social presence, and even going all the way back to the online deception stuff. If we tie all of that together, do you have an understanding of how this, uh, this story might have happened? why Monte Teo might have felt very uh, a high level of social presence, why, although online deception might not be as frequent as we sometimes think it is, why, given the right circumstances, it can happen. And it can lead to these very intense emotional uh, relationships and, and, and these really intense, real feelings. I hope so, because that has been kind of my goal. But it's also been my goal not to just explain Monte Teo's story, obviously, as kind of a relatively abnormal one, but also to help explain uh, some of the more normal things that happen all the time uh, in terms of uh, using the internet and social media for relationship development. 
Now, as always, we've just scratched the surface on this topic. Um, if you want more information about what we've talked about in this part, I highly recommend you take a look at, at this link. This is uh, some online resources from um, a communication theory textbook. Uh, and these resources have a lot of, there's a lot of resources about each of the theories. Specifically, there's some good stuff about social information processing theory and a little bit into hyperpersonal as well. Um, one of the best things I think that you'll find at this link is a video of, of the textbook writer of Griffin talking to Joe Walther about this theory. So I highly strongly recommend you take a look at this link. Now, I also want to say it's been my pleasure uh, to talk about these things with you. And I'm looking forward to more discussion, and I'm looking forward to hopefully on Saturday um, being able to talk to as many of you as possible about these things if you found them interesting. I certainly find them interesting. I love talking about this stuff. So feel free, even after um, this week is over, to get in touch with me if there are things you know dealing with these issues that you'd like to keep talking about.